family has never owned a dog. My brother is on the upper end of the autistic spectrum and he's terrified of animals, so I never really related to my friends when they would ask questions such as, who's gonna look after my dog when we're gone during the summer holidays? It wasn't until I was a little bit older that I realized that they probably found it really strange when my parents couldn't come to my netball matches because we couldn't find anyone to look after my grown brother. He needed two adults with him at all times. I remember feeling so angry because my brother couldn't function in this world, or rather, this world was not designed to allow him to function at all. The sound of loud cars, the feeling of rain on his clothes, even going to the toilet in public when it was already occupied. We couldn't even go for a walk because if someone got in the way of his perfect straight line, it would cause World War III. If it wasn't for the carers that would look after my brother for two hours a week, my family would never have ever left the house. I remember the first time that we went to the cinema and we weren't asked to immediately leave. It was one of the best days of my life. Those two hours were everything. So as soon as I was old enough, I wanted to give those two hours back to another family. I became obsessed with learning everything I could about the care system. I started working in a chronic care setting alongside my A-levels. I was looking after adults with acquired brain injuries and autism and dementia. I was feeding them and caring for them. I was looking after their finances and taking them shopping. I was showering them. I was even sleeping in the room next door to them to make sure that if they had a seizure, they weren't unattended. And I loved doing all those things. But when the UCAS deadlines came around, I did not choose nursing or medicine as my career choice. I loved science and maths. I loved looking after people, but I just couldn't imagine myself in a care setting because my experiences were very difficult to reconcile. I was always exhausted because we were always understaffed and I was emotionally broken because I didn't have the tools I needed to do my job properly. And I was anxious all the time because carers are blamed for everything that could go wrong. And even then, even after all that, after keeping people alive and healthy, I didn't have enough money in my bank account to pay for my car insurance. So because I liked science and maths and looking after people, and being able to pay for my car insurance, I picked engineering. The problem with engineering is that whilst I was sat in my lectures learning amazing things like how to take, turn cow manure into jet fuel, I couldn't help but feeling sick in my stomach at the thought of my patients alone without me. Not just because I knew exactly how they liked their tea or which Doris Day song was their favorite, but because when I left my last shift at my last care home, I left one nurse alone with 32 other patients. 32 patients who needed cleaning and washing and feeding and care and attention. If you're a carer and you're watching this, I'm so sorry. You know exactly what I'm talking about and the system is broken. In the report conducted by Unison, 54% of carers were found to have been overworking without pay. A famous quote reads, a true test of a civilization is how it treats its most vulnerable members. But by 2041, over a quarter of people in the UK will be 65 and over. And even then, Disability rates are skyrocketing alongside that. And despite over 10% of the UK's workforce already working in social care, do you know how many people who have the audacity to ask for long-term care actually get it? 25%. The system is broken. And I actually even failed my second year of university completely because I had my own medical problems. I had no confidence. I was at rock bottom. It was actually my professor at the time that asked me to speak today. But back then, I was asking him for help on dropping out of university. I had no faith in myself, and I couldn't see how my course could help me help other people. But I'm so glad my professor had faith in me and convinced me to carry on and retake the year. But I needed to survive on my year out, so I went back to working in chronic care 80 hours a week. 
And I was so depressed because the problems I had faced years before were still there. I remember sitting in a care home thinking, somebody out there must be doing something about this. And that's when I came across a report released by the Royal Academy of Engineers called Engineering Better Care. It was incredible. It had photos of engineers talking with care professionals and trying to figure out how the system worked and how to improve it, exactly like I had done for years. It was talking about using engineering principles that I was learning about in university, such as value stream mapping and process improvement through a logical lens and even failure mode analysis to fix things for vulnerable people. And it made sense because engineers are taught how to define very clear problem statements and then to drill down to root cause and fix that root cause so that that problem never persists. That report married my strengths and my passions. It reminded me that I was not supposed to sit in a corner solving equations. I was supposed to be solving problems because engineers are here to help people. I had a new passion and a new reason to carry on with my degree. So I decided I was never gonna fail an exam again. And I put my head down and I aced every exam afterwards, even during a global pandemic. And it was during this pandemic that I had called my best friend, Molly, who was a medical student at my university and a carer during a time of the highest hospital admissions in COVID-19. All she could tell me was how defeated she felt and I was heartbroken for her. So I frantically researched anything that I could find on engineering solutions that could possibly help my friend because I thought back to that report by the Royal Academy of Engineers. And to my surprise, I had found a group of engineers at the Cambridge Institute for Manufacture who had used their whole master's degree to model patient flow to make sure that COVID testing at local hospitals was optimized. They had seen a problem and decided to fix it, which is what engineers do. So I called Molly back and I said, Molly, I'm so sorry that you are going through this. The system is broken. So let's fix it. And to this day, I have no idea what came over us, but we got a team together and we decided to design a solution. And it worked because of my engineering background and her medical expertise and our first-hand experience of the problem. We took this solution to the Department of Health and they called it groundbreaking. And remember, I had been failing uni just a year earlier. I was planning to drop out and it was only recently that the Royal Academy of Engineers, the same people who released the report that I happened upon on my year of failure, they awarded me with a prestigious scholarship for leadership for this work. And it was only then that I realized what engineers could really do to help people. I met an engineer who was designing medical devices that were keeping babies alive. I met somebody who was designing breast pumps that women could hide in their clothes so they could still go to work and express. I met somebody who was designing healthcare access systems for people in rural Africa so they didn't have to walk for more than two hours just to see a doctor. Engineering became like a superpower to me. In a published lecture by the Cambridge Institute for Manufacture, Professor John Clarkson recounts a time when he was asked to design a care journey for a man nearing the end of his life. One of his team members asked a gut-wrenching question that serves as a poignant reminder of why we do what we do as engineers. They asked, who's gonna look after his dog when he's gone? Thank you. <laughs>